Uh, Sam Parsons is a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Experimental Psychology at Oxford University. And Flavio Acevedo is a research associate at the Institute for Communication Science at Friedrich Schiller University in Germany. So go ahead. Perfect. Um, so I've shared a bunch of uh, links in the chat just so that it saves doing it later. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk about um, this project, the Framework for Open and Reproducible Research Training. Um, it's something that I'm really excited about that myself and Flavio kind of started a few years ago now. Um, I'll start by saying that FORTS, as we affectionately call it, um, is very much a collaborative um, kind of crowdsourced grassroots project. Um, I'm very thankful to everybody that's involved, um, particularly in this case, um, Ike Rink, who is actually in the other breakout room leading a discussion now, which is why he couldn't be here leading this session himself. Um, so it's really nice to, uh, to represent all those involved. Um, and it's particularly nice to be talking about this project within the context of uh, democratizing um, scholarship. Um, I will try and avoid open science and use open scholarship. That's definitely my preference, but it's hard to, to not slip sometimes. Um, so it's really nice to kind of bring things together in that. Um, as a, a prime, I suppose, um, I'm very much hoping that the next time we give a talk similar to this and describe thought to people, in my ideal world, we'll have a few of your pictures in this people section as well, because this is very much an ongoing project and we're really seeking to be as inclusive as possible and get people involved. Um, that I think is the way forward for many, many of these projects. Um, so Fort kind of started largely with the idea that open research practices, at least in our perspective, we're largely talking about the research practices, which is great if you're going to improve uh, individual research projects or researchers practice, practices themselves. But it was kind of missing that training component, that component of what are we leaving uh, undergraduates and postgraduate students with in terms of their understanding of the process of doing open and reproducible research as opposed to kind of being given the results of research alone. Um, and thankfully, let's just double check this works, there we go. Um, what's kind of always been on our mind and very much driven by Flavio, which is why I'm happy that he's here, um, is part of Fort's mission, amongst other things, to kind of foster social justice through the opening of these materials. Um, we are also very aware, as it was pointed out earlier in the panel discussion, um, very, very well, I think that this is hopefully going to be part of the solution of opening materials and kind of sharing them. But we, uh, as Antoinette very well put, this is kind of a single approach. It's imperfect and it's in progress. So any feedback, any improvements that we can make, how we can make this better and more useful for people is something that we're very keen on learning. Um, so we kind of began with three broad uh, beneficiaries, I suppose, of the integration of openness and reproducibleness uh, within research uh, teaching and training, um, both in terms of, I guess, more formal training, but also in terms of mentorship through research projects, for example. And of course, that would include um, future scholars. So one would hope that if uh, an undergraduate or postgraduate student is kind of brought up with openness and reproducibility, that's kind of pushing them into the world of being able to uh, live these practices more uh, natively, I suppose. Um, but um, research training shouldn't only benefit the people that are doing research in the future, it should benefit the people that are consuming research. So we strongly believe that kind of incorporating openness and reproducibility within research training broadly should help the consumers of science as well as uh, kind of citizen scientists and crowdsourced projects um, by having that information out there and by having that training be both available and more routinely part of research training. Building this um, slightly more, um, we've been thinking about the consequences of kind of opening the teaching materials themselves as well as the pedagogy behind them that I will 
talk about a lot more later because I think this is one of the aspects of thought that I'm extremely keen on. Um, now we hope that this will benefit um, individual instructors and mentors themselves in several ways. Um, now this would include having better access to materials and the pedagogies behind those materials, both in the development of one's own courses and the adaptation of courses to include um, open practices. Because what we were made very aware of very early on, um, and as I think will come to no surprise to anybody here, um, is that instructors in academia are quite hard stretched. Um, and that is probably more more so this at this point than any other time. Um, so it's really not beneficial, I think, to say openness and reproducibility should be taught in any kind of authoritarian way. However, what we hope to do is provide the resources that will help kind of uh, help support that transition, that adaptation as much as possible to kind of reduce the burden, I suppose. Um, now, this kind of comes into the community building and support benefits that similar to, I guess, research itself, if teaching materials and pedagogy can kind of build on one another, if we can really kind of stand on the shoulders of giants, then hopefully that will kind of build the resources, um, build the, the capability to, to learn and benefit from uh, the sharing, the reuse, the adaptation of educational materials. Um, and while we have and kind of began with a focus on open and reproducible research practices, um, I should say that we're also uh, trying to push as much as we can for the uh, diversity, equity and inclusivity of the, the resources that we, we are sharing as well as within, within the organisation and I'm really keen to figure out with everybody how we can do that to the best of our capabilities. So we think that there are lots of benefits to, to the opening and the sharing of these materials. Um, now, largely thought is kind of based around this educational nexus. There's a number of things in there to which um, I would direct people towards the website that I put the link to in the chat, but I'll just kind of share a couple of these uh, ongoing products and projects that we've been working on as part of thought. So we started with uh, clusters that describe uh, open and reproducible research practices. This is an example of conceptual and statistical knowledge. We have open and fair materials and data. We have pre-registration and so on. And the idea is to sort of provide a framework for instructors to be able to think uh, and find resources that are relevant to the aspects that they're kind of interested in, either incorporating or building on within their materials. And a large part of thought itself is being able to direct people to those materials themselves um, in order to kind of support this ongoing take up within training of openness and reproducibility. Um, to build on that, we have a database of curated resources. Um, this, I think, contains somewhere in the region of a thousand or so papers, blog posts, um, syllabi, I think, databases, resources, tutorials, and so on. Um, so largely this, uh, we hope, is a very easily searchable and indexable uh, database with uh, fairly decent metadata to be able to find resources uh, more easily to use within, within your teaching. Um, and we hope that that'll be kind of useful as a searching tool. Uh, building on that, we recently launched the 100 Summaries project that's actually closer to 200 Summaries now, in which um, kind of in two broad categories, we have a bunch, I think the majority of them are kind of papers relating to openness and reproducibility. And we also have a growing number of papers and resources relating to diversity, equity and inclusivity. Um, now, the purpose of this in some ways is to provide kind of bite-sized summaries for for example, instructors developing syllabi to be able to find papers that are relevant to give out and to think about the readings that could be involved and to kind of really quickly navigate this space of what could I include in my, in my training, in my courses or in developing my own understanding. More recently, um, we have an educators corner in which um, educators can begin to share um, essentially blog posts, I suppose, um, 
around their experience and stories um, around teaching and mentoring, both in terms of openness and reproducibility, um, but also in terms of things like representation, like this first post from Heather Yuri. Um, and we think this is a nice place to be able to share in some ways the kind of behind the scenes or the hidden curriculum, as I've heard it referred to, of um, academia, particularly in terms of education. Um, most recently, we launched Fort Pedagogies. Um, the idea behind Fort Pedagogies is to provide resources that kind of go beyond, a step further beyond the training materials themselves and provide sort of even more context and information to educators on how they could reuse, adapt, um, and kind of benefit from these resources. Um, so Julia Strand here was our uh, very willing kind of first, first person to engage with this. Um, she already had this whole course completely open and available, including materials, uh, slides, syllabi, assignments. But she kind of took that extra step that we, we worked on to, to really give a lot of information around how she delivered the course, how she developed the content, how she would recommend delivering it, um, and how other instructors could use this resource to benefit them. And we really hope that the four pedagogies kind of becomes a growing resource to, to benefit the very sort of time poor and overburdened instructors in developing, adapting, and kind of building their future training. Um, so looking forward, there's a few things that um, I've not touched on. Most of them are in the website. Um, we do have a few kind of building social justice initiatives that we kind of hope will begin to work towards four aims of uh, building inclusivity, diversity and equity within, uh, within research training, I suppose. Um, so some of which are the open office hours and the remote mentorship program, We're trying to pair people up and offer various different platforms where people can uh, sort of seek help in a way or advice or information or be directed towards resources um, or just talk to us about how they can get involved in Fort itself. Um, and very much kind of essentially anything that we can do to also support um, instructors and early career researchers, particularly from underrepresented and underprivileged groups. These are kind of beginning in the works. It's quite early days. We're really keen on making these more useful. Um, and part of that is uh, why I'm really happy and excited to be in this kind of discussion, because I think by virtue of being in this breakout room, uh, I think everybody here probably has some ideas about on how this could be done well. So it'd be really nice to, to discuss this a little bit as well. Um, now I'll end with a bit of a pitch. Um, we want Fort to grow. We want it to be able to benefit as many people as possible. And partly there's uh, various different ways that you can do that in terms of spreading the word, signing up for the newsletter, um, using the materials that we've shared on the platforms as well as submitting your own. Um, but perhaps most importantly right now would be kind of an open invitation for you to join our, our little and growing community. Um, we kind of started and had a fairly heavy psychology focus, but it would be amazing to become more diverse in terms of being less westernized, for example, but also in terms of uh, building social sciences more actively in, because we're very aware that there's many, many blind spots for lots of different reasons um, within our focuses. And we want to make sure that uh, Fort as a project, as a kind of platform, benefits the most people that it can. Um, so we're very keen on having people involved, having people join. Um, the Slack channel that I shared in the chat is a great, kind of starting point, we'll have onboarding sessions um, to kind of familiarize you with everything that we're working on. I've described maybe half of what we're, we've been working on. Um, if there's particular things that you think that we're doing right or wrong, we're really keen on hearing back about that as well. So I'll finish with a, a thank you as well as just a repeat of all the links. I'm really keen on hearing back from, from everybody. I know that a few other uh, members of Fort are here today as well. Um, and 
largely we're just keen on supporting the already overburdened instructors as much as we possibly can. Um, Fort was very much born from a, a love of instructors, I suppose. So we're, we're keen to hear from you on how we can make that better and hopefully you'll join us too. So thank you. And uh, I think there's hopefully plenty of time for a, oh, yeah. a chat now as well. <laughs> Yeah, we've got some time for questions and, and comments. So um, yeah, again, use the chatter or unmute yourselves. I've got some, but I, I don't wanna I don't wanna dominate the floor. I'll, I'll chime in with a question, um, maybe hopefully not the same that Kitty had in mind. Um, this is uh, fascinating and, and impressive. Um, I guess uh, one thought question comment would be as you're reaching out to uh, educational use of this, um, how are you tracking that? Which, you know, there, there, as you can show variations thereof, examples thereof, people tend to remix the materials. They won't necessarily take them as is. Uh, it, it might be very useful and informative for others to see, hey, this can actually be integrated into biology, into economics, into political science, and how did they adapt it, et cetera. Uh, do you have any plans to, to do that kind of tracking of self-registering or something like that? It's, it's something that we've, we've talked about a few different ways of making this work. So I, in my ideal world, it would integrate with um, almost some form of version control, but also kind of DOI tracking so that, so that everything's fully indexable. Um, partly so that um, teaching materials can kind of be, and especially the pedagogies, can kind of be treated as um, academic outputs in a similar way to kind of using, for example, a data paper to describe a data set to actually use the academic incentives to kind of benefit those that are doing something extremely valuable. But I think that some form of version control and kind of branching would actually be a really nice way of doing that so that you you kind of combine the essentially the citation, I suppose, of previous materials, as well as further um, kind of pedagogy reflections on how those, how you develop those materials, how you further use them, um, and how they can be applicable to other situations. I kind of hope that as we build the pedagogies, we can also build in, at the very least, reflections, but possibly mechanisms as well to suggest how either different fields or different approaches could benefit from similar trainings, because obviously some will be very highly tailored towards subjects, whereas some will probably be more integrated as, for example, a methods module or something like that. Um, but I do think that's something that's important. Um, I think we might need a, a whole team to, <laughs> to work on, on that as a kind of sustainable project. Um, well, I mean, it, if you find the right mechanism to self-register and then just monitor that, that might be the, the least cost. Uh, I guess the other question, given the diversity of the team and, and where some of your team members are, is uh, multilingual. I mean, especially for, for the social justice and, and, and uh, equity of all kinds of access, um, getting even some basic materials, uh, not just integrated into different disciplines, but also integrated into different languages. Uh, undergraduate uh, training is almost certainly in uh, always in a local language, not necessarily in English, even if graduate training mostly uh, or many countries is by now in English. Uh, so that might be something to focus on as well to, to uh, achieve some outreach. And uh, my guess is that you already have some of those tools within your team. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that's cropped up a, a few times. I think, I think largely it's um, as, as with any project like this that kind of relies on volunteer time you kind of want to balance the the overburdening people while also knowing that their their expertise and their experience is so valuable that you kind of need it <laughs> to make things work but definitely translations is one of the things that's been on our kind of running agenda for a while um and i hope that we can kind of build that into uh specific kind of workings
I'm kind of curious about the um, how you're maybe it's too early, but, uh, you know, thinking about the sustainability of an initiative like this, which is really exciting. Um, but you said it's it's volunteer run. And I'm, I'm curious about I guess I've seen I've seen some open science, open education initiatives that are, are volunteer run that don't that haven't like thought about governance. Um, very carefully from the beginning. Uh, I'm not accusing you of that at all. I'm just curious of like it, what you've, how you've thought about that so far. Um, or if you like, if you're considering, you know, applying for funding um, to actually support someone to, to work on this or, or yeah, what, what your approach is. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I might accuse us of that at least in the early days. <laughs> I, I, I think we, we've definitely improved in terms of the, the general structure of the way that we work things so we've we've largely kind of split into teams to work on specific projects so it relies less on specific people kind of managing everything um last year in particular um flavia led just about everything in some way or some form and was kind of um it was very much the we had a bus factor problem for those that are familiar with the term um the idea being that if if Flavia were to disappear one day last year, I think Fort might have not quite continued running, at least in any functionable form. Um, but I think the future of Fort is very much to to be applying for funds and to try and make it sustainable in that way. Um, it's, it's on our agenda for this year. <laughs> um, so if if anybody's familiar with funding initiatives like this and approaches, we're we'd be keen to talk to you as well. Um, especially I, I think that is, to, oh, sorry, Fabio. Especially when it comes to the um, making for a legal organization, we've been trying to find out what is the best place in Europe or the US to have the organization um, have a legal status so that we can apply. Uh, recently, we tried to help a um, scholar that is within the Ford community um, with a very specific and fitting um, um, grant proposal. And unfortunately, in the end, we couldn't apply because Ford didn't have the legal status. Um, and um, so now that is very much in our radar and we hope to learn how to achieve that. I'm sort of wondering who might be the, you know, best partner to scale what what my understanding of what you're trying to do I mean you know one example is having heard from Brexit that uh, British speaking students have been thrown out of Erasmus but are now co-creating Turing would Turing actually be an, an opportunity for guys like you because if we're going to create a worldwide exchange of new uh, methods uh, could student exchanges be one way through that but I, I don't know education's alternative channels in terms of which one might be your best marketing partner for what you want to do um yep yeah, i i don't know <laughs> is the is the honest answer um i i think in some ways we're we sort of have that uh, positive and, and negative of being one of those projects that kind of sits in between lots of different angles. So potentially we can apply for uh, funds that are more relevant to general open science projects, for example, or open scholarship projects. So, um, however, it might be too educational related for that, or it might not be. We we just need to start putting putting our name in for things and. Uh, and basically hoping to, to pay Flavio for all the time that he's actually put into making this whole thing function. As you can see, uh, Sam is too kind. But yeah, we're, we're looking for an alternative. So if you have any ideas, feel free to email us. Uh, there's uh, the link on the website, any help, or if you have experience, especially with legal status, we are uh, looking uh, to that majoritarily to help um, some of our less privileged students that would need the, the, the financial help in order to continue their hopes in, into academia as well as uh, into helping Fort's mission and uh, uh, projects.
have you have you considered any kind of like crowdfunding models i, I know it's 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 not always the best thing to do with with academics who aren't necessarily the the most well-resourced people um especially if you're working with students um but yeah i'm, I'm just curious if you've thought about that and if so no okay <laughs> oh, yeah but it, it's not a bad idea yeah i like that just because if, if you're, I mean, I, I guess the, you would have to kind of build up a, a community maybe before trying to, you know, ask for, ask people for, to donate their, their money or their time. But um, otherwise it's, you know, the, the amount of funds that you could get from that wouldn't necessarily be all that helpful. But I mean, if you're, if you're, if the point is to, you know, share those resources back out with the community, then it could be, um, it could be a, a compelling model i don't know i'm i'm still i'm yeah. i'm honestly trying to think of things like this for bits as well um we we run a not not the same kind of program but a, a similar or adjacent kind of uh community called the catalyst community and um it's it's hard enough even with you know two full-time staff to to even support something like that so i'm also trying to think of innovative ways to to continue um supporting them yeah. Um, <laughs> one, 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 I think one point uh, to what you said is the, uh, it's the idea that at least in several, in several ways, um, we are a very privileged group to be speaking about these issues, but for the great majority of students, materials are not open and access to these materials are not possible. So in this sense, that there's a lot of groundwork still that we have to make in terms of advocacy and, and freeing materials and opening materials that sometimes um, we forget, so to speak, to that the, for the large part of students across many countries, um, this advocacy is very new and very early and um, non-existent. Um, so what we're trying to do in several of our initiatives is to show it's possible, is to implement ways in which, hey, they do this, we can also do this as well in other organizations or in other universities, etc. So uh, the advocating part um, is, is central um, and it, it means that one day, maybe, uh, this crowdsourcing idea that you gave us um, might really come in handy. So thank you. So we've got about a minute left if anyone wants to, to make any last comments or questions. One quick question. Do any of you interact with the Education Commission of Gordon Brown, which is looking for very radical ideas to sort of uh, cross fertilize things ac across the world where, where, where maybe teachers and students have got the same problems and wanting to do something new or look at new curriculums or, or new modalities because, uh, I mean, you, you know he's the UN envoy for education, but the most radical side of him is the Education Commission, which has about 30 national leaders, each of whom explains reasons why learning is broken down in their nation for in a different way. So, um, being, being Scottish, uh, Oxford should have a good chance of talking to him, I would have thought. Can you repeat the name again? Gordon Brown, the past Prime Minister of uh, Britain, but who for the last 14 years has put all of his time into education at the UN. Uh, and the Education Commission, uh, which he runs, but which has 30 national leaders all trying to debate what is right and what is wrong in education from their nation's point of view, because there are different problems in different nations. I will only say that if he ever wants to speak with us, I'll make sure to be available. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the, for the suggestion. Okay. Well, I think we should move on to the next uh, the next talk. But thank you so much to Sam.